When it comes to whether farmed animals have a place in a sustainable food system and in our diet, I think the answer is yes. But I think we have to think about where livestock production can do more than just feed us to what could be obtained by taking a sort of environment first perspective. And in practice, that will mean a very, very substantial reduction on current consumption patterns. Hello, welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, mini season three, everyday ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the key questions and challenges in the field of environmental politics today. I'm Peter Andre from Carleton University, and with me is my co-host, Dr. Ryan Katz-Rosine from the University of Ottawa. Can we eat our way to sustainability? That's the question at the heart of the interviews we did for this episode. And those interviews looked at this question from a variety of angles, including, for example, the pros and cons of cultured meat, which are animal tissues grown in labs. But to keep things focused today, this episode looks specifically at meat from livestock animals. Because meat is said to have such a significant environmental footprint, the question we're really honing in on in this episode is whether consumers can solve our environmental problems, including climate change, by choosing not to eat meat. So this is a topic dear to both of us. Both Ryan and I study questions related to the environmental impact of livestock production and do research on sustainable food systems. And uh, Ryan, you have a very personal connection to this theme, don't you? Yeah, that's right, Peter. My wife is a farmer by occupation. And so one of the main things that our farm produces is organic pasture-raised meats. And you know that link to food production and animal agriculture in particular has really filtered into my own research. And it's really just kind of taken over my thinking of sustainable food systems. So um, I've led a project on the future of sustainable protein. Uh, I've looked at the climatic impact of the livestock sector, and I've uh, co-edited a book on this very question of whether meat can be a part of a sustainable global diet. So yeah, it's really taken over my thinking. It's one of the things that... um, that I'm constantly thinking about. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to do an episode on this uh, topic. Um, And I think it's also just an important uh, point that I wanted to note at the beginning of this episode, and just to be upfront about my own connections to food production and protein production in particular. Well, these are really important questions for me as well, Ryan. I've been teaching courses in uh, food politics and, and food system sustainability for a couple of decades now, and as well as courses in environmental politics. And so I am really interested in this relationship between uh, you know, making mo- food systems more sustainable and addressing some of the big environmental issues that we're facing, like biodiversity loss and climate change. Um, And I certainly, from students in all of my classes, you know, I'm hearing lots these days about, uh, you know, often people thinking about their own consumption patterns, uh, you know, and and their meat consumption in particular. Um, I hear about students who are becoming vegans or or focused on uh, plant-based proteins as a way to reduce their own environmental impact. So I know for a lot of students, there's these are really big questions that they're trying to wrap their heads around. So, Ryan, you went out and interviewed two experts in this area. Who did you talk to? Yeah. So first, I I went out and interviewed an increasingly well-known name in the world of soil sciences and the study of regenerative agriculture. That's a big buzzword these days. And that's a doctoral student at UC Berkeley named Paige Stanley. My name is Paige Stanley. I am a finishing PhD candidate at um, UC Berkeley in the Environmental Science Policy and Management Department. Um, I am originally from Michigan, but grew up in in rural Georgia and um, first got into the field of kind of animal ag in undergrad. Um, I went to a small liberal arts school and wound up taking this animal ethics class that really kickstarted my career um, as I think of it now. Um, And I did my master's research on uh, life cycle analysis of beef production systems. So thinking about the different ways that we can produce beef and its impact on um, beef greenhouse gas emissions, their net emissions, 
And also thinking about how uh, soil carbon plays a role in uh, helping to mitigate beef's greenhouse gas footprint. I also spoke to a very well-known researcher of sustainable food systems at Oxford University named Tara Garnett. So my name's Tara Garnett, and I'm a researcher at the University of Oxford, and I run a project there called Table, um, which uh, has evolved out of previous work I did with the Food Climate Research Network. Essentially, what Table is about is exploring what people talk about when they talk about food. In other words, what are the big debates that people are having about the the problems associated with the food system and argued solutions and why do people disagree? So how do they use and select evidence to diagnose the problems and offer solution? And what are the values that inform their selection and use of this evidence? So we're new, we're just starting up, but that's that's what table's about. So what a great combination of guests, Ryan. One's a researcher doing this high-level analysis of debates around food sustainability and food policy, and the other's literally getting her hands dirty by doing soil sampling in uh, regenerative farming systems. Yeah, that's right. So Paige's day-to-day really does seem to involve, you know, hands-on work, figuring out the relationship between grazing animals in particular, ruminant animals, and the environment. She really spent a lot of time with farmers and ranchers uh, and doing soil carbon sampling, trying to understand what they do and whether their practices can mitigate the environmental footprint of meat production. I spent the last you know, three or four years building a network of ranchers using an array of grazing management practices here in California that have been kind of uh, hypothesized to, to have an impact on soil carbon. They don't really call themselves regenerative ranchers, but that's probably what I would call them or what people would recognize them by. Um, But essentially, I go out and I take soil samples uh, across these ranches and I do a bunch of experiments with them in the lab to test um, whether or not their grazing management practices have been sequestering carbon, where that carbon is going in the soil, uh, what kind of persistence that carbon has in the soil. So thinking about short term versus long-term climate change mitigation, what impact that carbon has on water infiltration and other soil water retention properties. And so in the end, uh, I hope to have a really kind of social, ecological um, outlook on the way that these grazers are approaching regenerative ranching on their home ranches. So Paige really looks at these questions at the level of uh, soil and grazing management practices. And Tara, meanwhile, has participated in these high-level global food systems analyses through her work with the Eat Lancet Commission. Can you tell us more about that, Ryan? So I think many of our listeners will be familiar with the Eat Lancet Commission. This was a group that uh, an international body of of scientists that came up with uh, what it called the Planetary Health Diet in 2019. Uh, And Dr. Garnett was one of the commissioners uh, who was involved in this really comprehensive project looking at what kind of constitutes a healthy and sustainable global diet. Essentially, it brought a bunch of um, academics together to consider two questions. When it comes to food, what is the safe operating space for food production such that it doesn't encroach unduly uh, upon um, planetary boundaries. And one can have all sorts of discussions there about, uh, firstly, how you decide how much food takes up out of the, of the planetary pie. And secondly, we have a whole discussion about what boundaries are and whether they are a legitimate way of looking at things. So, But that was the first task. And then the second task was to look at what a healthy diet looks like. And then the third thing was, can you combine the two? And the answer that the report came to was just about. So that's super interesting, Ryan. I look forward to hearing more of Tara's thoughts and her reflections on the Eat Lancet report and its conclusions and recommendations. But to begin, let's delve into the specific question of ruminant meat production and whether it is or could be sustainable. So one of the issues here, as 
I understand it, has to do with how grazing animals like cows are raised and the environmental impact of those practices. You spoke to both guests about the idea of regenerative grazing. This is the philosophy of rotating ruminant livestock in grass-based pastures in a way that mimics the way herds of herbivores move from one piece of a grassland to another, with the idea that this might be a more eco-friendly way to raise animals than feeding cows grains or letting them range widely on pasture. So what did our guests have to say about that? Well, quite a lot. <laughs> but, uh, you know, first, I think we should just scope out the difference between regenerative grazing and what we might call conventional grazing a little better. So this is really Paige's wheelhouse. So I'll play a clip where she explains the difference. So kind of business as usual grazing, at least in the United States and probably also globally, would be um, a kind of low to moderate continuous set stocking. So that means ranchers um, have some set plot of land or ranch boundary, and they will graze their livestock continuously with almost no or maybe low rotation. So they'll leave them the animals out to have access to the entirety of the landscape, um, either year round or in the case of California, you know, they might be rotating between two or three or maybe four pastures, uh, depending on the season. And what that does is it causes a lot of, or it can cause a lot of overgrazing or patchy overgrazing. So cattle will return to the same kind of yummy uh, sources of vegetation in that paddock. Um, and they might leave other kinds of vegetation out there that they think are less yummy. So you'll get spots of bare ground and then spots of vegetation that um, are undergrazed. And that can cause a whole host of uh, soil disaster scenarios, including uh, soil erosion. It can cause um, woody plant encroachment or invasives. You can oxidize a lot of your soil carbon by having a lot of bare ground, et cetera, et cetera. So that's conventional grazing. And then she juxtaposed that with regenerative grazing. The set of principles that I've come to understand as, you know, quote unquote, regenerative or adaptive multi-paddock grazing is ranchers will, instead of letting their animals have access to, um, you know, the entire ranch at, at any given time, they'll group them into herds uh, of high stock densities. So a lot of them kind of grouped tightly together. They'll rotate them across smaller paddocks uh, that they often um, separate by mobile electric fence. And they'll do that relatively quickly. And so the principles are to, you know, rotate quickly and then each paddock will get a decent amount of rest before being regrazed. And so that does a couple of things. It prevents that kind of patchy overgrazing dynamic that can result in bare soil. It causes more uniform grazing at the more micro scale. So it's getting those animals to eat things that maybe they wouldn't normally eat on their first go round. Um, and then allowing the paddock to have lots of rest before being regrazed. As long as you're leaving enough photosynthetic leaf area, meaning as long as you're not overgrazing it each time, the idea is that those plants stay in a more vegetative phase rather than moving on to their reproductive phase and they maintain kind of a, a greener life cycle for longer. So it, it extends your grazing season, and it also keeps your roots alive in your soil for longer. So as maybe a non-scientist listening to this, um, the implication I'm getting from some of what she's saying is that maybe there's, you know, this has net benefit on bringing carbon out of the air and into the soil. Is that, is that a leap we can make here? It is a leap we might be able to make, Peter. It's complicated, though. This is how Paige explained it. We think all of those dynamics, in addition to the kind of more concentrated manure deposition at any given time, we think all of those are having an impact on soil carbon sequestration, meaning rather than losing carbon or just maintaining an equilibrium state of carbon, what we're seeing um, in you know, studies over the past 10 years is that we're gaining soil carbon um, on these ranches that are using these principles. So then just to be clear, it does sound like she's saying that they're finding that farms and ranches using this type of regenerative grazing management are seeing carbon being sequestered in the soil. And I suppose if that can be maintained, 
that's where this notion of regenerative grazing uh, comes from as a potential tool for climate change mitigation. Is that right? I think that's right. Uh, that's why we've heard a lot about this idea of uh, regenerative agriculture and in particular regenerative grazing. And it's taken off in particular in places like the United States, where there are actually carbon markets being developed around this type of uh, you know, grazing practice. However, <laughs> it's complicated. And both Paige and Tara, you know, expressed real limitations in so far as, you know, whether this can be a, a way to mitigate climate change, right? So um, the first thing is that we have to remember that ruminants, these are the uh, animals that graze, um, they emit a lot of methane, in particular cattle, right? And methane, uh, as our listeners will know, is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Uh, it's much more powerful than carbon dioxide in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of energy it locks into the, the Earth system. So I asked Paige what she thought of the argument that some people make that when you factor in carbon sequestration from reg regenerative grazing, that you end up with a system that's either net climate neutral or even climate beneficial. In other words, net negative after taking into account the whole system of emissions, right? Like the methane that's emitted above ground. Uh, the nitrous oxide emissions, and so on and so forth. Because I, I know that she's done a study, Peter, that has shown uh, net negative emissions. But her answer was a little bit more measured. She basically said, we need to be doing more research on this question. And more importantly, I think she turned to this question uh, of, of the need to take a more nuanced approach. So, she, you know, she really emphasized that there's an, an alternative to the conventional feedlot-based beef production system that is viable and that produces a lot of benefits and that those systems that rely on fossil fuel based equipment and fertilizers to produce grain that's fed to livestock are problematic and that regenerative grazing offers an antidote to those types of systems. Any gains we can get from soil carbon is great because we're replacing something that's been lost in the soil. Um, but I don't actually think that those systems need to be climate neutral or climate negative in order for them to be, you know, beneficial. I still think that there are huge benefits to ecosystem health, to rancher livelihood, to climate resiliency and adaptive capacity, all of these things that we're getting from soil carbon sequestration that don't necessarily mean that it has to be, you know, negating all of their greenhouse gas emissions. So to recap, Peter, Paige is essentially saying that while regenerative grazing likely has net benefits in terms of soil carbon sequestration, and certainly it can have uh, net benefits, Overall, you know, its value needs to be juxtaposed, right, with the, the broader system of environmental costs uh, of the conventional feedlot system that it could replace in a more potentially climate-friendly world. I see. So the environmental benefits of regenerative grazing need to be understood in relation to the systems they would replace. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, but some of my students might argue, well, that's all fine, but why don't we just cut meat and other animal products out of our diets entirely. Wouldn't that be better for the planet? And I, I take it that's kind of the direction that the Eat Lancet report encouraged us to go in. I'd like to hear more from you on, on that and your discussion with Tara. What did she think on these questions? Well, it was certainly interesting to hear Tara talk about her involvement in the Eat Lancet uh, Commission and, and the report and what it came up with. Um, the Eat Lancet Commission itself emphasizes a, a diet that's plant forward, uh, where whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes comprise a greater proportion of foods consumed. And I'm still quoting here, Peter, meat and dairy constitute important parts of the diet, but in significantly smaller proportions than whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes. So the Eat Lancet Commission uh, and the report came up with a diet that was not vegan, but involved a substitution of a certain amount of meat consumption and dairy consumption with plant-based alternatives, uh, in particular plant-based proteins. Um, and Tara, on the whole, you know, still did uh, defended a position that says we should uh, adopt a diet with a lot less meat in it for a variety of environmental reasons. I think that reducing reducing consumption of animal products is an extremely important part of it, perhaps less from a climate change perspective and more from a, a land use, because um, 
you know, if we use 40% of the Earth's surface um, for food production, that's 40% of the Earth's surface that is not available or less available for other living things. And, and we use most of that for animal production. And some of it is, you know, used in a way that is kind of coexistent with biodiversity and other forms of life. But in most instances, it's really, really damaging. So by cutting back on animal products, you are potentially, but this is dependent on a whole range of, you know, political and economic decisions, is potentially sparing some land for other life to flourish. So there's that argument. And uh, on the flip side, you know, Tara was quite sensitive to the fact that the Eat Lancet report has commonly been interpreted in the popular sphere and the media as pushing, uh, if not a vegan diet, a, you know, close to a vegan diet. And as she explained to me, in part, she thinks this is a response from people who really just put up their backs from feeling like they're being told that they had to completely change their diets, change their lifestyles. But a, a significant part of it, I think, was also people just misinterpreting or what she called willfully ignoring the the more nuanced findings of the report. Some of the critique was very justified and some of it was less so. So um, starting with the with some of the sort of justified critiques, uh, firstly, was that uh, the report simply does not discuss the middle part of the food provisioning system. So it looks at production and then it looks at consumption and it doesn't look at the transformation of food along the way. And linked to that, secondly, it doesn't discuss power relations and justices and injustices within the food system. That's a major shortfall, but it is also a consequence of the fact that we delimited our problem just for practicality. So that was that was one criticism. The second argument was that this was a sort of closet vegan agenda, which I think was pretty unjustified, partly because the attacks were sometimes personal, that you know, all the commissioners were were vegan. And of course I sat in on these interminable dinners and I think there was one vegan amongst them and, you know, maybe two, perhaps three vegetarians and the rest were omnivores. But that's a kind of personal attack. I think it was argued that the diet was a one size fits all solution. And I think that again was probably quite unjustified. In fact, it was pretty much a contraction and convergence approach. So it implied a very, very substantial decrease in animal product consumption in the the global north um, and di- dietary diversification away from a focus on, on highly processed foods. And then in the global south, it implied a substantial increase in legume, fruit and vegetables, and animal product consumption. And there was quite a lot of variation built into it. So it's really interesting to hear uh, Tara respond and and even refute some of the criticisms that uh, the Eat Lancet uh, Commission's report received, uh, such as this idea that it was a closet vegan agenda, um, or that it was promoting a one-size-fits-all diet. But I, I also get a sense that she's She's heard some of that critique, and um, I, I hear her saying that she's uh, she's continues to advocate for folks in the global north to significantly decrease their consumption of animal and animal products and diversify their diets. Um, but I'm also hearing some nuance in her claims. Just as an example, there's a there's a big difference between eating in chicken and beef, right? Yeah. So Tara did reflect on that being an area where she actually wanted to see more nuance in the report itself, uh, but not necessarily in a direction that most listeners in the West would have expected. You know, we're used to hearing the, the idea that from a climate perspective, it's chicken and pork that are uh, have a lower impact and therefore those should be favored over beef and lamb. But, you know, as you'll hear in this clip, Tara kind of expressed concern with that that idea, and in particular, the way that the report didn't really take the whole environmental picture into account? Where I was most unhappy with the Eat Lancet report was that it failed to consider the different 
costs and benefits of different kinds of animal production. So to the extent that it favoured poultry and pig production over ruminant production, um, implying that they were somewhat more sustainable simply because their carbon footprint was lower. So, Peter, as we've kind of heard so far, the interview with Tara did get a little bit into this idea of polarization of the popular discussion on meat and livestock in relation to sustainable food systems. You know, she talked about attacks, you know, personal attacks that she received for participating in um, the Eat Lancet Commission. And, you know, this theme of polarization uh, was something that Paige also addressed. And Paige pointed out that In part, that's because of the complexity of the issue that we see these sort of extreme stark positions from uh, people on this very issue. Yeah, maybe it is unnecessarily polarized because I think the actual truth always lies somewhere in the middle. And you only really get to it by wading through kind of a landmine of details and nuance and exceptions and trade-offs. And without all of that information and without the public knowing all of those details, and, you know, honestly, maybe... Maybe they shouldn't. You know, it's it's taken me 10 years to get to the understanding I have now. I don't really expect that of every single person on the planet. And so I think it's, you know, it's easy to come to hard truths like like people who are really polarized take. For example, you know, everybody needs to be vegan or um, we need more livestock grazing to reverse climate change, you know, kind of roughly representing the two ends of the polarization spectrum. I think you only come to really extreme opinions like that by knowing half truths. That's really interesting, Ryan, that uh, Paige is talking about uh, the more extreme opinions in the debate often being based in half truths. And I wonder, did did Tara speak as well about this uh, kind of polarization and these extreme positions? Yeah, she certainly did. Meat is neither God nor the devil, but you know that's not what you hear from social media. And I think I think there's a whole complex of issues i mean that that is what makes the livestock thing so really really interesting in that it encapsulates a whole range of concerns from ideas about identity and culture and tradition to notions of health to a kind of very tangible way of interacting with the natural world to discussions about animal ethics and animal welfare, and of course, both the environmental dimension and how we measure environmental impact and a whole set of uh, debates and questions surrounding that. So it sounds like both of our guests that you talked to, Ryan, are are saying there are a lot of gray areas related to animal agriculture and the environment. There's a lot of values and assumptions and half-truths that come into these debates. But further, the answers aren't black and white, uh, especially when we bring it back to the context of ruminants grazing in pasture environments. And just to go back to that point, you know, I gather there are controversies uh, right in there. I've heard some climate change activists argue against the potential benefits of regenerative grazing by saying that when it comes to the carbon sequestration potentials of soils, that this is ultimately really limited. So did that topic come up in your discussions? It did. And in fact, uh, Tara was a researcher who put together a really influential report that kind of um, called to question the the long-term storage capacity of pastures for, for sequestering carbon. You know, there's actually a lot of debate within soil science today about this very question. And I asked Paige about this question of whether carbon becomes saturated. And this is what she had to say. I kind of have two top line uh, thoughts and then I'll kind of unpack them both. One is that even if, you know, we expected to saturate soil carbon in the order of 50 years, that to me is still a near term climate change mitigation strategy. And it it doesn't negate the benefits uh, of doing it in my in my mind. So even if, you know, saturation were a thing, I'd say, so what? Like it's still far enough down the line to where we can utilize it as an as an important climate change mitigation tool. So that's one. The other is that I think the idea or the way that um the the public often views um carbon saturation in the soils in conversations like this, like so for example, to make arguments like we shouldn't be doing regenerative grazing because we're gonna reach carbon saturation. I think that that is a terrible 
miscommunication on the part of the sciences. Yes, there is a theoretical maximum amount of carbon that soils can hold, but it's theoretical. Soil carbon is highly dynamic. Um, it changes and it depends on your, your climate, your pH, your temperature, your precipitation, all of these things. And so to think that at some point in time, we're going to have this saturated sponge of carbon where no carbon is moving around, we're not adding, we're not losing any, and we can't add any more. I think that that's not true. And I think any soil scientist would agree. So Peter, she really went into a lot more detail here on the science of soil carbon sequestration. Um, I'm not going to play that here because I think it got a little bit into to finer detail than we need to. But I think the clip you just heard really sums up her position. You know, the point is there's a lot of potential for soil carbon sequestration, but how much room is there, you know, in, in, in any given soil pool really depends on a whole range of factors. So I want to turn back to the politics of animal agriculture now, you know, this this core question about whether we can solve our environmental problems by not uh, eating so much meat. What did Paige and Tara have to say about how this debate is happening and the implications for actually addressing the problems around climate impacts of animal agriculture globally? Well, as you might expect, uh, you know, both of our guests had a lot to say on this front. Um, and maybe to start, uh, Tara made the point that, you know, the purported benefits of regenerative agriculture have been misused by many actors to try to kind of maintain the status quo. And she saw that as a problem. My feeling is that regenerative agriculture has achieved a sort of prominence because it, it offers a kind of salvationary potential in its name and that it has gained a lot of traction among people who have quite a lot of land in parts of the world where those sorts of systems are kind of historically well suited. And I think what's interesting about regenerative agriculture is that it, it inspires people who are kind of thoughtful and enthusiastic and therefore inherently good farmers. And in that sense, I think it's very it's a very positive development, but I think what's more worrying about it is is two things. One is that it's it risks being co-opted by some of the kind of major corporates. You know, every every big corporate now has its regenerative agriculture work stream. Um, but the other big danger, I think, is that it doesn't address issues of power and it doesn't address issues of consumption, land ownership, and all the rest of it. What it can be accused of doing is propping up current consumption patterns. Look, we can carry on the way we are because this meat is regenerative. And I, I find that quite worrying. And I don't think it needs to be like that. But I think that's kind of the way it can be used sometimes. So that's really interesting. So there's a risk that uh, advocacy for regenerative agriculture as a, as a climate solution can be co-opted, that, um, that it may not encourage changes in consumption patterns in the direction that uh, she thinks is really important to go in, and um, that it's also missing some of the power relations uh, in the food system and, and other problems in the food system. So those are all really interesting points. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, this episode was called Can We Eat Our Way to Sustainability? Our series looks at everyday ecopolitics and the roles of individuals in their daily lives. So I wonder, did she have any advice to say about what the individual can do in terms of what they're going to eat every day? Yeah, it's a great question. Let's you know bring it back to the, to the topic at hand. Um, you know, given that Tara was part of the Eat Lancet Commission, uh, which essentially offered a form of dietary advice, I asked her, you know, what she says when people ask her how little, how much, what kind of meat they should eat. And she gave a really interesting answer. So firstly, there's the fetishization of the number. I always find that very, very difficult because 
the answer depends on what else you are or are not eating, how much you're eating, what else you're doing with your life and other aspects of your kind of carbon and environmental expenditure. So there isn't a single answer. You could take as a rule of thumb, you know, what am I eating now? Let's try halving it. I, you know, it, this is an arbitrary suggestion. I think one thing to bear in mind is that reducing doesn't mean eliminating. And I think, again, it goes back to this question of polarization, that, that people feel kind of threatened and disturbed. And I'm, I'm not talking about your students here, but the general public, because suddenly as soon as someone indicates that an aspect of their lives is problematic, it means that they have to somehow give it up altogether. And so people really and understandably kick back against that. Um, when it comes to how do I go about doing this? I mean, I think... <sighs> I think it's going to be different from each person. I th and I think, again, the motivations are going to be different for each person. So, you know, one way of doing it is to um, eat more vegetables, eat more legumes, question the centrality of meat on the plate, going beyond your personal consumption. If you're organizing an event or something like that, um, you know, making the food, you know, at least two thirds plant based or something and asking people to opt into eat meat eating. You know, there are a million such suggestions that I, I expect listeners to your podcast will be very, very familiar with. So Tara is essentially saying people should eat more of a plant rich diet. But she also made the case that the issues of the environmental impacts of our food system will not just simply be solved uh, through consumer choice. I'm totally fed up with the focus on the individual as the, the locus of responsibility when we know how much the consumption practices of the individual are shaped by a whole range of different scales of influence from the sort of the political and the economic to the kind of the familial, the cultural simply the timings and the routines of the day and, you know, trade relationships, all the rest of it. You know, the, the choices I make when I eat breakfast are very much circumscribed by everything else that's going on. So there's that. And also we know that the, the story of, you know, public health promotion is a story of failure because it has focused on the individual. And the reason it focuses on the individual is that, there hasn't been the political will to to experiment at, at more kind of structural systemic levels. And again, going back to this National Food Strategy report that just came out, I think what was so welcome about it for among in, among the NGO sector was that it made it clear that these are structural issues, structural problems, not not something that the individual could. Or, or indeed should have to tackle on their own. So how did Paige respond to this question of the role of individual consumer choice versus, uh, you know, national food strategies or government regulation or other forms of uh, collective action through the state? Well, I think our two guests were really on the same page here. Uh, Paige talked about how you know, how much her position on these issues has evolved over the time that she's been studying this issue. And, and she came to a, a similar outcome as Tara. When I first started in all of this, I would have solidly placed myself in the consumer choice bucket. You know, I was very, you know, I started by reading things like Omnivore's Dilemma and, and learning about Alice Waters. So like, vote with your fork was very much my mantra. And I think as I've learned more about the role of corporations and kind of the interworkings of policy in the farm bill um, and the way that the food system in at least the United States was created, I pretty much am solidly in the opposite side now. Um, thinking, you know, I am of the mind that uh, corporations <laughs> created the climate crisis and policy choices created the uh, agricultural and associated environmental problems that we have with agriculture today. And so I think the, di the direction of causality would point to policy and corporations. Um, but with that being said, with the way that 
kind of the federalist and, and democratic structure in the U.S. is structured, I would say it would be impossible to get policy change without some consumer push. Okay, that's interesting. So on the one hand, Paige is saying this is a structural problem and a policy problem, but she still sees a role for the consumer, the citizen, in terms of pushing for change. What does that look like? Well, that's a good question. I push them both on this issue a little bit by asking their response to a really highly influential article published in the journal Science a couple of years ago. And it's by these authors, Joseph Poor and uh, Tom Nemechek. And they did a, a really fairly comprehensive assessment of the environmental footprint of different foods around the world. And the lead author, Joseph Poor, um, was interviewed in a highly influential interview since then. He said, quote, a vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on planet Earth, end quote. So I asked both of our guests if they agree with that statement by Joseph Poor. I don't. <laughs> I think I think he'd be hard pressed to convince me that uh, yeah. dietary choices would eclipse the role that fossil fuel consumption plays in climate change mitigation. But, you know, one thing that I like to tell people when they point me to papers like that is that big global assessments like that often make it to journals like Science and Nature. And they often always come to the same conclusion, right, that um, a vegan diet or I've, I've also seen like an ovo lacto vegetarian diet being considered the best. They always come to that same conclusion. But it Global assessments like that, they lose all nuance that comes with eating and producing food. What we produce and what would be sustainable to consume in a place like California, you know, kind of abstracted from global environmental production is so much different than what would be sustainably produced and consumed in a place like Iceland or Greenland. And so to assume that there is a global sustainable diet is just asinine to me, if I'm being totally honest. And that's because even when we're thinking about accounting for greenhouse gas emissions from the livestock sector, the way that we're doing these different things like, like growing their food or, or grazing them or trucking food from elsewhere or how they're pumping their water, these are highly regionally specific practices. And they have an impact on the order of magnitude on the total greenhouse gas footprint of that animal. Change needs to happen in every single aspect of our, our lives. And I really, really worry about the kind of, I've gone vegan so I can fly, you know, fly across the world with impunity approach. One can be vegan and have a very resource intensive diet in in lots of other ways, both in terms of the selection of the foods one chooses and in one's practices around, I guess, waste or cooking techniques or whatever. And I also think that these concerns are interconnected. So issues around transport, issues around diet, how one chooses to spend one le one's leisure, all these things, they're kind of part of the same whole. So I can't see that that one can focus on one thing in isolation from everything else. I think that eating less meat is a very, very important part of it, but it comes with potential moral hazards. It's not a get out of jail free card. And there are lots and lots of other things we need to be doing as well. So that's really interesting. They both ultimately disagree with the broad claim by Joseph Poor that uh, going vegan is the single most important thing you can do to save this planet and stop climate change. And, uh, you know, from but from slightly different perspectives, right? Paige was really focused on this question of uh, that regionalism matters and food systems in different places are different and their environmental impacts are different and the production systems are different and that all needs to be taken into account. And uh, Tara really focusing on the fact that uh, diet isolated from other issues like transport and how one spends their free time, you know, you, you can't, can't isolate those things. It's neat to see that these two experts, even though they're coming from different places and disciplinary perspectives, actually end up agreeing on a lot. Animal agriculture, as conventionally practiced, has a lot of environmental problems associated with it. 
regenerative agriculture as an alternative approach has some potential advantages. However, it's not a panacea. And let's be careful of uh, the various people who will just want to co-opt it to keep the status quo going. Nor is a simple switch to a vegan diet the solution across the board. Um, But plant-rich diets are something that we should all be thinking about more. I'm curious, uh, Ryan, as a husband of a farmer, what are your takeaways uh, from these conversations you had with Tara and Paige? From what you heard, can we eat our way to sustainability? Well, I share a lot of the assessments that that both Paige and Tara offered in my interviews with them. Look, there's there's no doubt that from the point of view of climate change and the biodiversity crisis, there are major gains to be had from stopping the expansion of agricultural land, in particular, you know, stopping deforestation, and uh, from producing more food on the agricultural lands that we currently use. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to reduce the size of the global livestock sector and switch out some of the protein that we, we get from, from meat uh, for plant-based proteins, nuts, legumes, or those kinds of things. But on the flip side, uh, I think there's a tendency um, for some to want to go full bore, right? Uh, what, what our guests were talking about earlier in terms of polarization in, in this debate. And you see arguments in our contemporary eco-political landscape where people tend to want to see things in, in very black and white terms um, rather than the sort of the nuanced gray that they are and that I think they should be. So what I kind of mean here is that it's, you know, it's apparent to me that animal source foods have a, a really important role to play in the agri-food system, in social systems, and and in even in, in sort of an ecological and economic terms. So personally, I wouldn't want to throw the the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. I think that we can collectively have an impact on sustainability by changing the way that we eat collectively as a society. And in part, I do think that that means reducing the share of animal proteins in a typical Western diet. However, you know, I do think that animal proteins should have some role and that producers of all types of foods, meat or otherwise, across the food system need to find ways to reduce the ecological footprint of production. And so, Peter, that's my take. Okay, well, thanks for your assessment, Ryan. That's uh, really interesting, really interesting to hear your take as, as a farmer and as the husband of a farmer. And I'll turn it to our audience now. Do you think we can eat our way to sustainability? Should consumers stop eating meat or ruminant animal byproducts in particular? Where do you stand on these questions? We'd love it if you share our content and get in touch with us. Let us know what you think on the issues that we discussed in today's episode. So that's it for this episode of the Ecopolitics Podcast. Uh, Make sure to follow us on Twitter at EcopoliticsP and check out all the incredible artwork and additional resources like transcripts and pedagogical materials that we put together for each and every episode at our website, which is ecopoliticspodcast.ca. This episode was produced by Nicole Bedford. Support with transcription and captioning for season three is provided by Ashley Fernal, and Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. The podcast is made available under a Creative Commons license 2.0 Canada. So thanks for listening.